All right, everyone. Oh, here we go. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vincent Tam, and I'm a GI medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center in uh, Calgary. I've been asked to chair this uh, afternoon session um, regarding uh, current treatment of cholangiocarcinoma. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Julie Heinbach, who is a professor of surgery and chair of the Division of Transplantation Surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She is uh, currently the chair of the uh, UNOS Liver Intestine Committee, and one of her main research interests is the role of liver transplantation for cholangiocarcinoma. Julie. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, and thank you to the foundation for including me in this incredible meeting. I'm super happy to be here. And I'll just move forward here. Um, I was asked to speak to you about surgical therapy for cholangiocarcinoma. And, um, you know, per the discussion this morning, thinking about this um, disease by location, breaking it down into intrahepatic, perihilar, and distal. And the majority of this talk will be focused on the perihilar and some coverage on the intrahepatic lesions without uh, getting into the distal. Um, the basic summary is that this is a diagnostic challenge. The surgical um, resection is the mainstay of therapy. And unfortunately, the prognosis um, remains uh, quite a challenge for this condition. Um, the incidence, as we also heard this morning, this would be the second most common primary liver tumor, um, with the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma rising, while perihilar and distal appear to generally be stable, of course, with differences around um, various parts of the world, um, issues with classification, particularly thinking about location of the tumor, as part of the discussion earlier, and the increased accuracy of the diagnosis may be in part related to some of these shifts. Um, the range for this incidence, 0.5 to 2 per 100,000 in the West, but far higher in the East. The primary risk factor um, in the West being PSC and um, looking at things like clonorchis um, in the Eastern regions. Surgery is the mainstay for perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. Um, this particular tumor, um, as highlighted by the image, poses significant technical challenges um, with an R0 or a complete resection possible only in about 70 to 80 percent of the attempted resections. Why is that? Um, just to point over here, this is some very high stakes uh, real estate. That's the way to think about it. The tumor just sits itself right down among some very important structures being the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the bile duct. So those are all the structures we need to consider when we're trying to um, remove this tumor, but keep uh, a viable uh, part of the liver perfused and drained. Um, additionally, the location of the tumor as well as the relatively small size of the tumor um, does have an influence in our ability to accurately stage this by imaging. Outcomes for resection really depend most importantly on attaining a complete resection as well as the nodal status, the tumor grade, and the presence of vascular invasion. This is a recent paper that I think um, is unique in that the length of the follow-up is quite, um, is, is very long as you can see there, and the follow-up is uh, quite robust. So they really um, were able to look at their patient outcomes out to 10 years um, and looking at a complete resection versus an R1 resection, you can see that clear difference. What is very interesting, I think, about this is that the patients continue to experience recurrence even long after um, surgery. The median survival at 3.9 years with 43% surviving at five years overall and slightly more than that, 48% for those attaining a complete resection. This next slide is far too busy to be seen, except for the very last line, which just summarizes essentially all the major papers um, about outcomes for resection. Um, and again, the second column, those were able to have that complete resection, about 70%. Um, and of those that had that complete resection, um, or of the overall survival being at 31%, um, and the median, similar to what you saw previously, at 32 months. As most um, malignancies, the stage clearly influences uh, survival, and this is particularly true in the outcome of um, hyalur cholangiocarcinoma. You can see highlighted by the various stages, and probably you're not able to read the N in these differences, but this comes from the AJCC. Um, and the small Ns, unfortunately, are on the top. So the early um, malignancies are, are often not diagnosed, and the ones 
which contribute more significantly to this figure are unfortunately the ones towards the bottom. So the stage three and four patients contribute the bulk of this experience. So this um, summarizes a consensus statement um, where they looked at sort of a, a general approach, um, highlighting surgery as the main therapy, um, but touched on important findings like how to make the diagnosis um, with minimal diagnostic and staging workup requiring uh, cross-sectional imaging and CA99. Importantly, pathological confirmation not necessarily required prior to proceeding to resection or transplant, a curative therapy essentially, um, describing you know, op ways to achieve curative therapy, also the use of portal vein embolization, um, and for selected patients with resectable cholangio, um, considered for the neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy plus liver transplant protocol. So highlighting that more specifically, looking at basically how we do this, this current surgical management at Mayo Clinic, for a patient coming with a suspected hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, we do the appropriate workup involving cross-sectional imaging, followed by ERCP with diagnostic um, and stenting. And if you're able to confirm the diagnosis, we assess whether the patient is resectable. Sometimes they need, um, they're not going to have adequate volume. That would be the situation where we would consider portal vein embolization, and then they would proceed for resection. If they're unresectable due to local issues, then we can consider them for the transplant protocol. If they're unresectable because they have distant metastases, that's when we move to a different route of treatment, which generally does not involve surgery. If we can't um, establish the diagnosis, then we would basically continue to follow until we're um, certain of the diagnosis. So getting into specifically the transplant protocol does involve neoadjuvant therapy, including external beam radiotherapy with brachytherapy. We do perform a staging laparoscopy, and then we proceed to transplant. Um, the diagnosis and the eligibility are highlighted here. Again, most notably that we don't always get a tissue diagnosis, but we always do have a malignant appearing stricture, and at least either malignant cytology or histology or an elevated CA199 um, without cholangitis or polysomy uh, using fish or a mass on cross-sectional imaging. If the tumor is unresectable, then we consider for the transplant protocol, or if they arise in the setting of PSC, we would consider that patient to be unresectable. We would always want to exclude patients with metastatic disease, those that had a prior attempted resection where the tumor plane was violated, or if they had a percutaneous biopsy or an EUS-guided biopsy of the primary tumor where the peritoneum was exposed to tumor, so the diagnostic biopsy, that, that would also be one that we would not want to include. If the tumor was very large growing out into the liver parenchyma, the extension up and down the duct is not something we consider, but those tumors extending out into the parenchyma um, then would exclude if they were large. Thus far, um, we've been able to um, transplant 211 patients. You can kind of see how they've gone there down with about um, two-thirds having transplant from a deceased donor and about one-third from a living donor or now getting close to half from a living donor. And this is the um, outcomes at 10 years for intention to treat. So this would include patients that were not able to um, proceed all the way to transplant, so they would fall out either from disease progression while they were waiting um, or other toxicities of the therapy that would not allow them to proceed to transplant. So at five years, we're still able to attain a 51% survival with intention to treat analysis. And then looking at those that were able to get to transplant at five years, nearly 70 or nearly 70 percent uh, survival, and even looking at 10-year survival of over 60 percent. Um, we can divide these by PSC versus de novo, and we can see that we attain superior results for patients with PSC. We've looked carefully at that, and what it, it seems to be is actually we're able to diagnose the PSC patients earlier with um, more favorable tumor biology and whether we find them earlier and that's why they have more favorable tumor biology or um, there's something special about PSC, we're, we're not certain about that, but it does um, seem to be when we c control exactly for the stage of disease and other uh, risk factors that the outcomes are similar. We also were able to analyze this across other centers besides Mayo Clinic and this includes data from 12 centers, you can see quite Similar outcomes at five years, about a 65% um, disease-free survival. 
This has led to the discussion about surgery versus transplant and whether we should be even potentially thinking about uh, transplant in some of the patients who could be considered for resection. This is a paper from last year published in Annals um, involving 10 US centers. We were not one of the centers in this paper, but um, looking at patients who were considered for resection um, and patients that uh, had transplant. And when they looked at the patients that underwent resection but could have met the transplant criteria, um, they found that those outcomes were worse and um, that would then justify the idea of a prospective trial. Maybe we should be considering transplant for some of the patients that we are currently thinking about resection. The issue with that is that resection is really not safe after you've given these patients high-dose neoadjuvant therapy. An attempted resection compromises outcome for the neoadjuvant therapy in liver transplant protocol. So it's really not possible to cross over from one side to the other. If a patient is going down the transplant route, but they're found to have lymph node metastases, we don't proceed to transplant in that setting. So we would eliminate that as a therapeutic strategy for that patient. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's not completely clear if the patient is resectable or not resectable. And, um, you know, so for the marginally resectable candidate, when you're thinking if they have nodes, um, you know, that would be the patient to consider more pushing towards surgery. If you're undoubted about whether you could get a complete resection due to anatomic considerations, that might be the patient to consider more towards transplant. In terms of switching gears and thinking about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, of course, um, this is a completely um, different in terms of how they present. Typically, this is often an incidental discovery for the non serotic patient who is having routine imaging done for other reasons um, or um, for the patient who is being screened with cirrhosis and looking for HCC. We can discover this as well. Um, the imaging should be with MRI or CT. And it shows early uh, initial rim with um, peripheral arterial phase enhancement pattern followed by centripetal enhancement in the delayed phase. Um, sometimes the CN199 um, can be normal, but typically it would be elevated. Um, it is Im really important to utilize a biopsy to differentiate these, especially when they're small, from HCC. So how do we treat intrahepatic? Again, surgical resection is the mainstay for treatment. And again, the outcome is predicted by the size and whether we can get that complete resection, whether we have multiple lesions, and whether there are nodal metastases. Transplant, again, is something that has been described, um, but really it's, it's a much more restricted setting. So we do have some very preliminary data. This is a tiny number of patients. Um, for patients with very early intrahepatic cholangio, so this is less than two centimeters, an early report of eight patients showing 73% five-year survival uh, from 2014 led to a bigger um, series, again, tiny, 15 patients, 65% five-year survival from 2016. So now this is something that is being explored um, as a potential if you can select these very, very early intrahepatics as transplant candidates. This would be for the cirrhotic patient who could not be resected because of their cirrhosis. Maybe with a small lesion, this can be a consideration. Previously, sorry about that, it has been a contraindication to transplant. Um, other strategies, for example, uh, tear and TACE and external beam radiation therapy are being used more frequently and the role is being clarified for these additional therapies. This is a very nice um, algorithm and you'll hear from Dr. Rizvi, to, I think, um, later today or tomorrow, um, but this is uh, an algorithm she put together in terms of management for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. If they're a candidate for resection, that would be the main therapy. If they're not a candidate for resection, um, considering local regional therapy, um, and that could be radioembolization, chemoembolization, or external beam radiotherapy. And then if that was not, um, uh, if that didn't get the result that we wanted, we can consider uh, additional therapies. Um, if local regional is not an option to begin with, and they have good performance status, then going down uh, systemic therapy routes. Um, if they have poor performance status, then they would be considered for best supportive care. Um, this is an additional area where transplant has been described. Again, this is a teeny 
tiny series of patients, um, very recently published in Lancet Oncology. Um, a single center prospective analysis, actually six patients went to transplant um, in this first report with intrahepatic. So these were large, unresectable intrahepatic lesions, different from the early, um, you know, less than two centimeter intrahepatic occurring in the setting of cirrhosis. And so these patients were treated with varying regimens of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by liver transplant. They had a large tumor burden um, with an average number of four lesions and the size of 10 centimeters, primarily treated with gemcis, but also with a mix of other agents. And we were able to, they were able to see, um, and this is uh, from Houston, able to see prolonged survival in this subset of patients. Again, very, very highly selected leading to the question of, is there a way to pick these patients? If there is a way to pick these patients, what would be the best strategy, and could this be more broadly um, pursued around the country? So as um, Dr. Roberts asked us to do, thinking about um, areas for future collaboration, especially in this group, summarizing it by intrahepatic. Again, the standard treatment is resection. The outcome depends on stage. I think for very early, unresectable intrahepatic cholangio, these patients could be considered for liver transplant, again, in the setting of cirrhosis. There's a potential role for neoadjuvant therapy followed by surgery. We heard about that this morning at the ICRN meeting. Um, or even potentially liver transplant for these very large intrahepatic lesions, which would not be amenable to resection. Um, the questions probably for this group and, and other groups would be how could we select these patients? Are there mar markers, especially genetic markers, imaging, maybe response to therapy would be the way to select them? And what are the optimal therapies that should be considered in the new adjuvant setting? Non-surgical therapies such as tear or radiotherapy would also have a role, um, essentially either is in a combination in the above or as a primary therapy. And in terms of areas of collaboration for perihyler, um, the surgical therapy, again, is the standard of care for patients with resectable disease, which unfortunately is not every patient. Um, patients with early stage unresectable disease uh, could be considered for neoadjuvant radiotherapy followed by liver transplant because this can achieve favorable, basically long-term curative results. However, in order to make all of this work better, we do need better diagnostic tools to identify these patients earlier, so more patients could be considered for this curative therapy. Potentially, that you know, could be most easily targeted to the patient with PSC. We also need better new adjuvant therapy in this setting, um, certainly in the transplant setting, maybe in the resection setting. How about adjuvant therapy? Could that, could that also be selected for high-risk patients after transplant or after resection? Um, and then... One thing that may be unique to this group, um, but more broadly, um, this is my other hat. I, I am the, currently the chair of the UNOS Liver and Testing Committee. That's the group that does organ allocation for liver transplant. And um, there are some changes that we're going to need this organization's help with in terms of um, advocacy for patients because they're patients with hyalur cholangial carcinoma, the system is changing, and so we're going to need some help in lobbying for that change to go in the direction we need it to go. So we can reach out to me later if that's something you're interested in. And um, I think the panel is the time for questions. Is that right? Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Heinbach. So uh, 